Hello, welcome to um, St. Alphonsus and our continuing conversation about integrating our spiritual selves. Um, I continue to enjoy this conversation and I hope that it's a conversation that you're also uh, enjoying. And I thank you for all the comments and uh, the questions that you leave because that gives me an indication of how things are working uh, what needs to be clarified, and uh, in our conversation, which uh, direction to go. Um, as you can tell, I've brought a few resources with me this morning uh, because I need to reference them as we have this conversation. Uh, it's not that I can't remember exactly the points, but sometimes it's really helpful to use the exact words, especially uh, when you're quoting someone uh, directly. And so that's uh, what I brought the material for. Um, so far, in the first couple days that we've been together, I hope that you've been able to see the progression that we're making, uh, talking about who we are, first of all, as human beings, understanding that we're spiritual beings. Um, and as spiritual beings, we have human experiences. Uh, that it is in our human experiences that the incarnation teaches us, the incarnation of Jesus, teaches us that we can encounter God. Um, that in and of itself is a, a huge statement to make, um, a startling statement to make for some people, because there was a time in the history of human beings in which people thought that the best way to encounter God was to get out of the body, uh, to deny human experience. Um, and so to make the statement that it is in human experience uh, that you can encounter God is a uh, profoundly, in a real sense, almost new uh, experience for us as human beings. But nonetheless, it's something that the Incarnation teaches us, and it's something that's very important. And when you think about it, if you are, in fact, as we all are human beings, how else are we going to experience God if we can't experience God in our humanity? And that means in the fullness of our humanity. Uh, in the fullness of who we are. It means our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors, our choices, our decisions, uh, those things that are good, uh, those things that are challenging, those things that make us suffer, those things that make us question, and all of that is part of our spirituality. And when we talk about integrating spirituality, uh, we're not talking about integrating all those parts of ourselves um, and bringing all those parts of ourselves into the conversation. Uh, and into the experience, knowing that we can discover God in each and every experience, um, that we can learn something not only of ourselves, but we can also learn something about that which is holy, uh, that which is sacred. So we talked about human beings and spiritual experiences. I talked about the um, fact that as human beings, we are part of an experience of time, that as people who are in a particular historical moment, uh, we have a certain present, a certain past, a certain future, and that uh, a sign of healthiness, if you will, is to be able to navigate clearly between the past, the present, and the future. Uh, and again, to see that as an integrative whole. Uh, most of us would agree that if we're stuck in something, for instance, if we're stuck in the past, uh, ignoring a future or refusing to deal with it, or not even aware of what's going on around us, that's, that something is off, something's not quite right. So an integrative person is a person who is able to comfortably navigate the experience of being a human being in present, past, and, and in the future. At the same time, I talked about uh, as human beings, and as we grow and as we develop, uh, we enter into our experience and we enter into an understanding what truth means, uh, that tr uh, ability to trust uh, in relationship and to grow in relationship leads us to a, a state of vulnerability. Um, and then vulnerability, of course, teaches us even more about trust. Um, and then eventually, trust and vulnerability introduce us to that marvelous experience of relationship uh, that we identify as intimacy. And intimacy is essential to being a human person. It's essential to who we are as human beings. 
And it is in our intimate relations, not only that we understand what trust is and what vulnerability is, I would go so far to say that in our intimate relationships, we encounter the sacred. Uh, we encounter, if you will, God. Uh, we certainly, in our intimate relationships, encounter Jesus. Because when Jesus speaks of his heavenly Father, it is a language of intimacy. It's not a sterile language. It's not a language of religion. It's not a language of uh, systematics or it's a language of intimacy when he speaks about his Father in heaven. And when he speaks about the kingdom of God, it's not just an idea. It's a relationship. It's a commitment. It's built on trust. It's built on vulnerability. It's built on an experience of intimacy. So all those things are a part and parcel of an introduction, if you will, to authentic spirituality and trying to come up to an understanding of what it means to integrate ourselves as spiritual beings. In the background of all this, of course, is the idea of human consciousness. Uh, human consciousness, uh, the ability to be awake, uh, to be aware, to be engaged, um, to fully and, and actively participate in life, uh, is a gift that each and every one of us, of, of us have been given. And it is a gift that must be engaged, or at least that is the promise of healthiness. If you can engage your consciousness, your ability to think and to reflect, your ability to be aware, uh, your ability to make connections, your ability to see, all of those things help us in our uh, understanding of what it means to be a human being and certainly uh, a spiritual being. And it's consciousness that I would like to speak about a little bit more this morning. I didn't think I was going to go in this direction, but um, I think I have to because of how we're experiencing life right now. Uh, this whole experience of sheltering in place, of being um, present to a smaller group of people, or in some instances, being alone for extended periods of time, uh, the fact that our normal routines have been changed, the ways that we experience life are no longer as predictable as they were three or four weeks ago. The uh, experience, the feelings that well up within us perhaps of a missing human touch uh, or missing conversation that we've taken for granted or realizing that we make certain choices to leave the house that perhaps we're putting ourselves at risk, or the anxiety some of us feel. All those things that are taking place right now are going to have an impact on the society in which we live, not only in this moment, but in the moments to come in our future. So it's not just a present experience. It's very much also a future experience, and it is, by its very nature, also going to be an experience of our past, of our shared history. And I would go so far as to say that this has not happened to human beings before as a global presence or experience. We've never had this type of experience before. We've had isolated experiences of this, but we've never had a global experience of it. And it would be foolhardy to believe that that's not going to change us. We're not going to go back to normal. Normal is going to be impossible. It's going to be impossible because many of us will have changed. And we will have changed fundamentally because of this experience. And the place where we have changed is going to be in our experience of what it means to be a human person, what it means to be conscious, what it means to be aware. It's going to change us in ways that are um, powerful. And none of us know exactly what that means. But it is certainly something that's going to happen to us. It's going to change, and the reason I bring it up to us, it's going to change our spirituality. It's going to change the way we understand the important things in our life. It's going to change how we understand relationships. 
It's going to change how we understand values. It's going to change all sorts of things, experiences, relationships that we haven't even begun to imagine. Phyllis Tickle, um, in her book, The Great Emergence, How Christianity is Changing and Why, um, is talking about change, but she's not talking about our experience right now. Uh, this book was written uh, long before this experience, and uh, Phyllis is referencing a completely other uh, experience. But nonetheless, she wrote this, and I think that it's very, very important to hear and very important to think about. She writes this, she says, in very much the same way that spring seems to slip up on us week by week, year by year. And even though we may have sent a thousand signs of its approach, we are still surprised to wake up to a busy chirping world that a mere few hours before had been a gray and silent one. Our surprise does not mean that all of us have failed to notice the first subtle shiftings of the seasons. It just means that most of us haven't bothered to think about them because at a practical or useful level, spring isn't here until it's fully enough here to make a difference in our lives and what we decide to wear, how we plan our activities and what to do with our time even in what and how much we decide to eat. So what Phyllis is saying is that when change occurs, it's not always dramatic. There's signs of the change around us, but it's not always dramatic, and also that not everyone pays attention to it. But the thing about change is, you don't need to pay attention to it. It change does not need your permission. It does not need your awareness or attention. If change is going to happen, it's going to happen. Regardless of what we see, what we think, what we feel, or if we agree or we disagree. And so when I'm talking about the kind of fundamental change, that we're going to experience and continue to experience as human beings as a result of this pandemic. I'm talking about the stuff that's going on around us in ways that we can only get a glimpse of, but we know because we have the ability to recall our past that this change is going to be fundamental. We don't know where it's going to lead. But some of the things that it is going to bring us to an awareness of are questions that are essential in our spiritual journey. They're questions that we need to answer, that we need to answer singularly as a human person for ourselves. We need to answer them for our families. We need to answer them for our communities. We need to answer them for our nation, for the world in which we live. And one of the things that this pandemic teaches us is that we cannot give answers that are in isolation. We cannot give answers that are valid answers only if they meet my needs. They have to be answers that include the many rather than the few. And this is going to be a fundamental change in the way that life is. Now, of course, as spring unfolds around us and all the signs and symbols are around us, there are also signs and symbols that people aren't paying attention. One of the symbols that you're going to see is you're going to see people who are oblivious, seemingly oblivious to anything that's going on around them. These are people who, uh, they're not bad people, but they just are so into themselves, so into their world, so into their choices and their decisions that they honestly don't see until it, it comes up and smacks them in the face. And so we're seeing examples of people who are oblivious. We're seeing examples of people who are faced with this change who are just denying it which is also a wonderful human experience. You deny it. 
You know, so if I deny it long enough, if I say that it's not there, perhaps it will disappear. Again, as I've said, and as we know, change does not need your permission. It doesn't need your attention. If something is going to change, it's going to change regardless, whether you pay attention to it or not. Another thing that you'll see during this time is frantic anxiety. People who are running around trying to do all sorts of things just because they feel that they have to respond. I think people going out and buying 10 years of supply of toilet paper is a perfect example of frantic anxiety. Nobody needs 10 years of toilet paper, but it feels like you're doing something. It gives you a sense that when you open up your guest bedroom and you can't get in the door because it's filled with toilet paper, that you're prepared. It's not true, but it gives you a false sense of security. The other thing that happens is you see people entering into, especially when you see uh, religious responses to what's going on around us. You see people entering into things that were appropriate rituals, liturgies, conversations, ways of acting that were appropriate six weeks ago but seem to be extremely hollow and lifeless now because they're dependent on the ability of a community to gather together. They're dependent on all sorts of things and components that are necessary to make the experience real. And as those abilities and components are stripped away and all you're left with is the singular something of whatever it is, it comes up almost empty. All of these are examples of the change that are around us. All these are, are examples of how it's changing our human experience. And all of these are examples on how we are going to be challenged to act as human beings, especially as spiritual human beings. Some of the questions that are going to come to um, the forefront quickly, and we see them being played out for us right now, is where does authority really come from? Where does it come from? Who is in charge? Who are we to believe? How are we to act? People are questioning that today. Right now, it's not a tidal wave of questioning. It's just questioning that appears in normal conversation. But nonetheless, people are beginning to ask, are the places and the people that I used to count on for direction, are they giving me direction that's helpful? Is it life-giving? Is it essential? Is it necessary? And when people return, as we will in a few months, when all of this settles down and they return to places that they used to go to for authoritative answers and directions, the person who is leading those discussions better have been coldly and completely engaged in what's going on. Because if they have not been engaged in what's going on, their questions, their answers, their teachings are going to sound so very, very hollow, so very, very incomplete. That's just the reality of where we are as human beings today. That brings us to the second question that as human beings, we are going to be asking ourselves, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean? Why is it that some people are able to get all the medical care and attention that they need? Other people are not. Why is it that in some countries we're able to respond and respond in a very positive way to what's happening to us? And in other countries, there's no response. What is the difference in human life? Is my human life that much more valuable, that much more important because of an accident of birth, because I happen to be born here as a person for instance, who's born somewhere else that doesn't have the advantages that I have? What does it mean to be a human being? 
and what are our responsibilities towards each other. And then a question that comes up and continues to come up is, how can we live together? How can we live in a world that has been shattered forever from the presumption that we are not connected to each other? How do you live in a world that has been changed so radically that it demands that we acknowledge the fact that all of us are in this together? It kind of makes some of the rules and regulations that we have that we find comfort in, it kind of makes some of them feel really, really stupid, really, really incomplete. All those are questions that we have all the time in life. They are never questions that we haven't had. But in this particular experience that we're sharing together as human beings, they're even more important. They're even more essential. And they're going to change our understanding of spirituality. They're going to under change our understanding of who we are as human beings. And so we have to be prepared for it. We have to listen to it. We have to enter into it. Uh, we have to learn from it. People who um, reflect on all this through the centuries, and there have been people who have reflected on seismic change in human behavior, in human consciousness, assure us that we will, in fact, change. We will, in fact, adopt new behaviors. We will, in fact, find a way to live together better. We will and find a way to be more whole, more integrated, uh, more blessed, more healed, more graced. But there's going to be a lot of different steps that we have to take between now and that moment. Now, for a person who is fully and completely engaged in their spirituality, we have some advantages. We have some great advantages over those who are not engaged. One of the advantages that we have is we're not afraid of the questions. We're not afraid to ask the questions. We're not afraid to come up with an answer that's incomplete. As people who are spiritual, we're not afraid of mystery. We're not afraid of the unknown. It's okay. In fact, we understand that that is in fact reality. That whenever we fool ourselves to believe that we have all the answers, whenever we fool ourselves to believe that we're certain about everything, whenever we live as if we don't have a care in the world, we understand that we're not fully engaged in our humanity and we're not fully engaged in our spiritual selves. So we recognize the uncomfortableness of it. It's okay. In fact, it's essential to be tense, to be having a feeling of living on the edge, to have a feeling of not knowing. It's okay. It's who we are. It lets us know that we're alive. It lets us know that we're part of the universe. It lets us know that we're part of this great experience of life. It's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a true blessing. So as people who um, are spiritual people, we're not afraid of the questions. The other thing that I think that perhaps that you might have learned these last few days is spiritual people who are trying to be fully integrated into their spiritual life are not afraid of vulnerability. It's not a bad thing to be vulnerable. It's not a bad thing to stand before the universe and be small. It's not a bad thing not to know. It's a not a bad thing to be dependent. It's not a bad thing to be expectant. It's not a bad thing to be any of those things. Spiritual people learn through their spiritual journey that vulnerability is an example of something that we could perhaps within our Christian understanding, call grace. It's something that proceeds the moment when we understand that we are connected and not disconnected. 
Vulnerability brings us to the next, the next miracle in life, if you will. The next good thing. The next wonderful thing. And there's no thing that we can use to replace it. There's no shortcut. Vulnerability has to be experienced before we can fully engage the intimacy, the relationship, the connectedness that we know and that we desire and that we hope for. So as spiritual people, we're not afraid of the questions, we're not afraid of the vulnerability, and as spiritual people, we try to see the finger of God in everything. We don't use God as an excuse for what's happening. We see, rather, the finger of God present in everything. Not just in a singular moment, not just in a singular decision, not just in this small thing. You see God in the whole picture, the fullness of everything, the wonder of everything, the mystery of everything. And in that, you experience the fullness of what it means to be divine, what it means to be sacred, what it means to be holy, what it means to be whole, and finally, what it means to be integrated and authentic. If you want to find a way to live in this moment, if you want to find a way to see in this moment, if you want to find a way to experience the fullness of this moment, look to the scripture, look to the life of Jesus, look to his relationship with his heavenly father, look to his relationship with the people with whom he lived and worked, look to his prayer, look to his vision, look to his hope and see the fullness of God's life and love played out in our midst. He shows us the way. He enters fully into how we can respond. And in his way, and in his truth, and in his life, we too can find what we need. So as we continue our journey and we meet again tomorrow, I told you today I was going to go into practical steps. I'll do that starting tomorrow. I just thought it was important that we talk about this at this time because it's part of who we are and part of our experience. Have a good day, enjoy yourself, and God bless.